Hi, I'm Mauro Porcini, PepsiCo's Chief Design Officer. Join me for our new series where we dive into the minds of the greatest innovators of our time, with the goal of finding what drives them in their professional journey and in their personal life. Trying to uncover the universal truths that unite anyone attempting to have a meaningful impact in the world. This is In Your Shoes. To me, the main and most exciting thing about photography is to meet people. The picture is the result of what happened between me and them on set. I'm quoting our guest of today. He's an Emmy Award-nominated director and an internationally known photographer. He has directed music videos for artists like Jay-Z, Beyoncé, Lenny Kravitz, and commercials for brands such as Apple, Fiat, and many others. In 2016, he debuted at the Venice Film Festival with the documentary Franca, Chaos and Creation, which went on to play in over 20 festivals all around the world and is now available in Netflix. His photographs have appeared on the covers and pages of Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, W Magazine, Rolling Stones, New York Magazine and Vogue, amongst others. He has photographed personalities as diverse as Robert De Niro, Kanye West, Naomi Campbell, Angelina Jolie, Michael Bloomberg, Keith Richards, and Jeff Koons, just to name a few. Francesco Carozzini, welcome to In Your Shoes. Fra, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. It's the first time that my host is also a friend of mine, so it's quite <laughs> exciting. Yes, I mean, we know each other very, very well, right? And, and you have been... An inspiration for me in so many different ways over the years here in New York, sharing so many different experiences. So you are a photographer, you are a director, and you are an entrepreneur. You, are in, you have been investing in so many different areas and fields. And you come from Italy, from Milan. How did you get all the way to New York, to LA? You live between the two cities. Tell us a little bit about your story. It's not the story of the the boat that traveled to America, but it's still a story of uh, of dream and uh, uh, of aspirations. Ultimately, my my story obviously starts in Milan with um, where I was a, a student, uh, where I studied philosophy, um, and uh, where I was uh, uh, in a world uh, because of my mother's job, who at the time was the editor of, uh, of Italian Vogue. I was really involved in this, uh, not only fashion, but I would say culture uh, environment, uh, because fashion touches, so, it's so mediatic and it touches so many other um, fields that... Um, uh, I, you know, that's where I kind of like started opening up my, uh, my vision, my dreams, uh, my interests and, uh, film and photography have always been since the very beginning, probably also because I was really, uh, a kid when in the in the offices of Vogue uh, we were receiving pictures uh, of the likes of Bruce Weber, uh, Peter Lindbergh, uh, Paolo Roversi, all the best image makers uh, of the world, uh, um, I really started finding this fascination for these people. Uh, my mother would send me in the summer to intern at the photographer studio or to see or go work for a magazine maybe in a different country. And um, and so I took all of this experience and, uh, and one day, um, half uh, because I was running away from a girlfriend, half because uh, uh, I wanted a new experience, uh, I decided to venture to New York, uh, where I lived uh, in, uh, in Tribeca with four friends, uh, three friends plus me four, in an apartment, uh, and, you know, started like most of other kids in New York, really. And actually, it's interesting because you never stop discovering people, you know, during your life. I didn't realize that you study philosophy. I, I, it's been always a passion of mine. I, I, I was always divided between the world of art and design, but also wanted to study literature and philosophy. How did philosophy influence who you are today and what you're doing today? Yeah, you know, I think it was really the, the, the best way to, to put it. And, and I want to make a note here out of protest. I did all my exams and I never wrote my thesis. So I'm not a graduate. I'm only a high school graduate, really. 
but uh, you know, because those things that you do when you're young, uh, you don't need a piece of paper, which is which is uh, wrong because I now regret it. But uh, obviously, the substance doesn't change. I studied philosophy because um, I was. Uh, uh, interested in opening to other possibilities that were not only what I was uh, I was doing. I would always try to change and 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 my my point of view and things. And most importantly, to doubt. Doubt is really the fundamental uh, part of philosophy, but not the negative doubt. Not the oh my god, what I'm going to do, but. Uh, Am I doing things the right way? Should I do them differently? Uh, why am I not succeeding at something? Should I turn uh, onto a different, uh, you know, uh, in, into a different direction? Um, do I even want what I want? Uh, what I say I want? Do I want to be a filmmaker? Do I want to be a photographer? Uh, this is really, I think, the engine. And and to the and to this day, yes, I've wanted all the things I've done, but. Um, to this day, I still don't have certain answers. I, you know, I'm about to embark in this big venture next year, making my first feature movie, feature film. Uh, is this what I want? Yes, now it is what I want. Uh, am I doing it the right way? I don't know. I'm figuring it out. There's always, there's never like a certainty in what I do, which I think uh, becomes a positive. It's not insecurity. It's it's uh, uh, which also can be positive, but it's really like. A general doubt that makes me challenge myself constantly. That is the best uh, way I can explain it. I, I love it so much. It's always that push that comes from within to ask why and what is the meaning of things and am I doing it for what reason and what is my purpose? And, and I really see it in you, but a lot of people think that philosophy is so far away from entrepreneurship and innovation. And in reality, they are totally merged to the, to the heat. There's a, there's a very interesting uh, thread that connects uh, that, that through philosophy or, you know, if, uh, uh, you know, the, the meaning of philosophy, as we know, is uh, the, the love for, for, for knowledge, but it's not knowledge. It's the process of thinking and of uh, rearranging thinking. This is really, and, and you know, uh, through this, I became interested in so many other things. Uh, one of the biggest tragedies of my life, which was my mother's death, transformed into this deep interest toward genetics, uh, towards the, the reading the code of life, which, you know, who would have ever thought I would have gotten there? Studied Greek and Latin, studied philosophy. I'm from Milan, no scientific background whatsoever. And now I talk about uh, CRISPR-9 and, you know, it's, it's, it's quite, um, it, it's quite, in, it, it really is quite interesting that process of, uh, of constantly uh, rechallenging your thinking, which that, is really that more about that genetics. I, I remember you invite me at Harvard to, and it was fascinating, you know, the spin of a director, a, 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 a photographer, a creative guy, and that interest that you had on, on the field. Can you tell us more about? Yeah. That? Yeah. The, the, you know, everything from me starts with the, and that's probably the photographer filmmaker side starts with stories. Uh, but I think for most people, it's all about storytelling since the, 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 the beginning of, uh, of time. Um, I uh, was um, trying to solve a problem that was unsolvable. I was trying to save my mother from dying, right? Which is a very normal instinct that everyone would have when you understand that someone close, so close to you is sick. And so I started looking everywhere. And I, and I had a, a very good friend who uh, at the time, also very, very interesting guy, was a musician, but was becoming a biotech entrepreneur, okay? <laughs> so uh, I was like, well, if he's interested, why wouldn't I be interested? And, and why wouldn't this be potentially an angle to understand what's happening to my mother? So I went to Harvard and I met uh, Dr. Robert Green, um, who is uh, responsible for many incredible things. One is the first genomics, uh, genetics, whatever you want to call it, clinic of preventive medicine in the world. Um, he uses, he leverages genomics uh, to try and prevent disease. It's not only about curing it, but it's trying to anticipate uh, which is, to me, a very interesting concept because, you know, ultimately, 
the real the real av- av- advantage we have with technology right now is that we can go so deep into people's uh, uh, you know uh, code of life, what we call um, and that that genome that we can really um, potentially and we do already anticipate things and even this year very interestingly change them. So the the winners of the Nobel for uh, Science this year are two women who discovered gene editing, okay, which is a mind-blowing concept. So through these researches, I started getting so interested in it and um, and ultimately it resigned with me. There, you know, it could be because I got into it through a very sensitive time or it could also be just because it's something that really spoke to me. Uh, and so that's the story of how it started. Now, it became, uh, two years ago, it became a, a, fo- a foundation, uh, which is technically still a fund within the Harvard uh, Medical uh, and the Women and Brigham's Hospital. And we are trying to raise money for uh, research, for the most part, to allow Dr. Green and his team to have the time to write papers, to get grants, and to advance uh, this incredibly fascinating field. Well, we start this conversation with me saying that you are inspiring. We didn't even touch yet on photography, creativity, design. We talk about philosophy, we talk about genetics. I think the people listening to us understand what I meant at the beginning of this conversation. Uh, and, but actually, this is what we call design thinking. You know, at the end of the day, it's deeply understanding people, human beings, their purpose, their motivation, and then figuring out how we can serve those needs and wants with solutions of any kind, literally of any kind. Now, talking about inspiration, you mentioned a few times your mom. By the way, we didn't name her yet, Franca Sozzani, the the, the iconic, mythical Franca Sozzani, uh, editor of Vogue. Uh, You know, you you grew up in a in a situation that is a little bit surreal for many of us, more normal people, in the in the arms, so I, there are pictures of you in the arms of Madonna, Sylvester Stallone, a friend with Naomi Campbell, with so many different celebrities, you know, long, long list. How that kind of surreal uh, situation when you were a kid influenced your life, both in the positive, because a lot of people may think, well, that's beautiful, it's fun, it's easy. The reality is that I guess there were also struggles and difficulties and, you know, coming from that kind of uh, background. It's not everything, you know, as easy as it may seem. No, it's, you know, it's easier certainly than other situations. It's maybe uh, in the beginning, it's very easy because uh, uh, you don't understand it. So I remember when people asked me what my mother did, I I said she sold newspapers (laughs) and... uh, (laughs) And I didn't really understand that she didn't really, they were not really newspapers and they were magazines. She was not really selling them, but making them. Um, and there's the funny, you know, we always laughed about it with my mother when they asked me in school, you know, what, Alessandro, what does your father do? You know, my father is a lawyer. What, and then this woman who sells magazines. Um, so I didn't understand it for a while. Uh, when I understood it, um, Weirdly, and not maybe so weirdly, I started feeling a little ashamed of it. Uh, I started feeling a little bit, um, you know, weird about it because uh, my friends, again, were lawyers. The father was a dentist, a doctor, um, you know, an architect, but um, more, more, let's say, traditional jobs that didn't have all this glitter and glamour. Um, but ultimately, uh, it gave me a lot of confidence. And the reason why it gave me confidence is because um, in my job, uh, 90%, and I'm not exaggerating, is about the relationship you establish with your collaborators. So if you are on a set with Beyonce um, uh, doing a music video, or if you are on a movie uh, with uh, such and such actor, um, the relationship you have with them and the trust you, they should have for you is is big. It's a big, big part of the component. And, and then everything else comes after. The talent, the lighting, the, you know, but you really have to have a very deep uh, relationship. And feeling kind of part of that world somehow made me always feel comfortable around these people instead of uh, nervous around these people. And so... Uh, you know, uh, I always say 
I kind of miss that I was never a fan, you know, like a, in the technical, you know, way. Yeah. Although I'm a fan of, uh, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson, I would die to meet Paul Thomas Anderson. But like maybe that's not the typical person someone would be a fan of, uh, or George Church, one of the biggest geneticists in the world, uh, or Renzo Piano, you know. Th those I'm a fan of, but I've never been a fan of like the singer or the, and so I missed on that in my life. But at the same time, I definitely uh, was helped by this because I felt very good around these people. But the, then the, there is also another dimension. Uh, in my life, I met many son and daughters of renowned people, celebrities or people that have been very successful uh, in any field. And they grow up and they feel the weight of the parents' success. And then when they're kids, they, they are the reflection of their success. But then when they become young adults, they need to show that they are as good as their parents. And often many of them suffer of this situation. You are one of the few actually that found his dimension and was able really to find its way in his unique way and, and your own path. What kind of suggestion, advice, recommendation you may give to any other kid and your parents don't need to be celebrities it could be just you know parents that have been very successful in their life and you feel the weight of and the pressure and you need to show to your family to yourself probably before then your family that you can be as good as them what what do you, what would you tell them it's a it's it's a question that i always answer differently because um, it depends on the emotion of the moment what you think right but definitely <laughs> Definitely, it is a big uh, conversation that I will always have in my life. Uh, you know, my mother was very successful, uh, but not only was very successful, was also uh, very uh, complete as a person. She was uh, involved in charity. She really helped people. Like, uh, you know, when she died, hundreds of people texted me, you know, your mom gave me the time I would have never expected she would have given. So... When you set a standard, my mother was, a, for the most part, a single mother mm, who raised me, you know, however she could. Um, so when you set your standard that high, uh, obviously, it's very difficult to, to, to compare ever. And I think one of the secrets is really to stop comparing very early, uh, which I think I was able to do early enough. Um, and then to really jump on the train of your passions you what you believe in uh, the, the things you have love for um, with and I must say this was uh, I think a combination of luck as well as uh, you know being raised in a certain way you need to be a little bit angry and hungry like there are there are these two forces that you really need otherwise, Uh, if you if you always think you have a fallback, if you always think, uh, well, then if things don't go well, I can do this. I wake up really. I, I don't say this to lie, you know, to to be extreme, but I really wake up every morning thinking, this could be the last day I live this life, and I have this luck, and I have these chances, and that is really what my mother taught me um, indirectly, you know, she would, she would, we would go to eat uh, in a certain restaurant or, you know, be in a certain uh, situation, uh, traveling abroad. And she would say, remember, this can end. And uh, I don't know, that really gave me a lot of, and, and still to this day, you know, I really, you know me well enough to say, I'm never like, well, I'm going away three months and doing this. And that. There's always like, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? Um, and uh, a combination of all of these really helped me, as well as being very lucky that I was recognized uh, uh, in my job. Uh, you know, even after my mother passed, I still worked with very high profile people. I still do today. And that's, uh, you know, a blessing because it confirms to you that you need it, that you are worth something. Yeah. I, look, I, I think is the mix of having, you know, certain kind of circumstances that life gave you, you know, being lucky and privileged in a certain way, but then the ability to leverage it. And that ability is a mix of skills, is a mix of resilience, is a mix of vision, of ideas, of willingness to, to take risk, 
curiosity yeah. curiosity yeah keyword so that's 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 really important you know parents any parent any mother any father play a very important role in the life of people i i realized this in the past few years if you do a little bit of uh therapy any any therapist will tell you you know about the role of of your parents in your life and and my dream personally will be to write about my parents and the role of my mother and my father. Every time in any interview, I, I mention them. Actually, I'm writing a book and I'm mentioning, you know, what, what they meant for me. You, you had the amazing opportunity that you created for yourself of even filming an entire documentary uh, on your mother and then also the relation with your mother because you are the director, but you're also the protagonist together with her. Uh, is a documentary we can find in Netflix. It's called Franca Chaos and Creation. Uh, it's a beautiful story. Uh, I saw you, you know, from the inception, the idea, the funding and the development, you know, I remember the beautiful journey and then finally the joy of seeing it in Netflix. Can you tell us more about that journey and then what's inside, what, in, what is in, inside that documentary? What, what do you want yeah. to communicate to the world? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, you know, the, the film, as you said, uh, therapy, th this is the way I saved money on therapy. Let's put it this way, because, uh, you know, spending all that time with uh, a parent that you really don't live with, you know, I left home when I was 17. So um, I never really, as an adult or even as a young adult, lived with, with my mother, or would, although we were very close emotionally and, uh, and we spoke every single day. Um, the film started uh, because... Uh, in 2010, uh, I was losing my father, and so who died very early in 2011, and um, I really was. Uh, I, I had this realization. I was like, "Wow, my father is about to be gone from this world," and other than a few, the, you know, the memories that I have, which are not even many because my father never lived with us, I have nothing. I don't have his voice. I can't listen to his voice ever again, and you know. And how do I compensate this? So I said, well, I turned the camera on the person who was next to me, my other parent, who actually I knew better and who I had more access to. And I started filming her. Um, I knew from the day one that I was going to make a movie, but I always say, well, I started doing this. And that. But I knew from day one, I said, this will have to become something one day, you know? And uh, a few months later, my father passed. And then I went to my grandma's house and... Um, and I started digging for material and I find these eight millimeter uh, tapes, um, reels of film. Mm, and uh, we, we transferred it. And I started uh, looking at this young girl when she's eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, growing up. Um, and that's when I said, okay, you know, this needs to become a movie. Um, the inception was long. The making of was uh, very painful. Also, it was my first film, long film ever. So all the challenges that a first film bring with you. Um, and then uh, a few mentors helped me uh, very much. Um, Amy Berg, who was a great documentarian in, in America, and uh, Buzz Lerman, who uh, gave me one of the best advices. He said, make the movie only you can make. Uh, don't make the movie anyone else can, you know. And so all of these process became this uh, documentary that in uh, almost like in uh, Almodovar movie, uh, you know, uh, was ready when my mother got sick. So this was kind of like a, a circle that was closing in a, a very strange way, you know, bad and good at the same time. We got to finish the film and... Um, you know, a few, literally a few months later, we were in Venice, uh, premiering the movie together in uh, in the in this in this auditorium at the film festival. And uh, two and a half months after, my mother died. So it was uh, kind of like the best way to say goodbye. And at the same time, I think it is. It's hard for me to ever make uh, for a while. Let's say any art that has this importance for my life yeah it's such a it's so moving and touching even the way you you tell this story uh, you you've been working i mean you are a master in um, 
working with images, photography, video making. You've been working with so many different people and celebrities. And, and you know, I work in PepsiCo and we work with the culture of image and the pop culture of images across all the different brands. And, and it's so important today more than ever because of the social media world we live in, the Instagram society we live in. Uh, how important it is photography, images, videos, all this kind of content for a brand. Yeah. You have been working with many brands as well. Yes. It's it's very important. Um, it's more important when the brand knows uh, better uh, than you uh, what they want because you become basically the bridge between you know them and their vision. And... Um, I feel there's a lot of disconnected, uh, disconnected, uh, you know, uh, way of, uh, of of certain brands. Obviously, not the big brands that are established and that did a very good job, but like, you know, and even some of them, there's uh, there's a big disconnect between who the brand is and what they communicate, and and I think it always comes really to this, uh, uh, you know, to this traditional way of saying, okay, tell us who we are, you know. And I like to to work with brands that tell me, you know, this is who we are. Help us tell this. This is the very dif- different um, pro- uh, process. Um, that's how I got interested in uh, investing in companies because I understood that there are some companies that do it and some companies that don't do it. Um, and uh, the importance is obviously huge. Um, the problem today is that even if a company tells you who they are and what they want, um, oftentimes the, the phones and the accessibility of technology have on one hand helped anyone to communicate. On the other hand, they completely uh, broke the mechanism of uh, what you know content creators uh, used to do back then. Uh, you know, um, in and back then I talk about 20 years ago, not uh, in, uh, you know, 1930s or 50s. Um, so we are witnessing as image makers, as uh, filmmakers, as photographers, uh, that there are some traditional ways uh, of doing things that are still holding up. Um, you know, uh, storytelling is always, no matter the transformation, it will always be relevant. Now movies are suffering a little because it's a little bit about more about TV, uh, you know, certainly a certain way of taking pictures has been replaced by by phones, even video. Um, apparently now, you know, uh, with the, the, with new phones, I have a very old phone, so I don't know. But you can have, uh, you, you know, for Lana with your phone. Am, am I wrong? I remember yes. wrong. Yeah, for Lana Del Rey, we're talking with, yes. with the phone, yes. right? And exa- and that's actually a good a good idea uh, to talk about. Ultimately. What matters is not uh, that you are replaced uh, or you are replaceable, but what matters is your idea. Yeah. If you can film anything with anything at this point, as long as the idea holds, as long as the storytelling holds. I personally, because I trained with a certain level of photographers and I like a certain quality, I will always prefer to do things, you know, I would always prefer to shoot on film. I would always prefer to do certain things. But ultimately, it doesn't matter anymore this much anymore. It's about the ideas. Yeah, yeah. You, you're working with some big brands, right? I mean, like brands like Apple, if I... I w- yes, I worked with Apple. Um, uh, I worked with uh, companies like uh, Tommy Elfiger, like uh, Mercedes, Mini, uh, you know... Uh, it's a, it's a it's a very long list. Um, well, what's one of your favorite projects with one of these these big brands? You know, I really enjoyed um, working on this series called Up Next with Apple Music um, because the 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 canvas was quite uh, you know white and uh, and open, and so the idea was let's start telling stories of young. Uh, let's give voice to a new generation of musicians. And it was coming in a time of my life where I already worked with uh, everyone from, uh, you know, Jay-Z to Beyonce, 
uh, to you know Lenny Kravitz to all of these artists of different kinds, uh, Nicki Minaj, and so I thought how refreshing and interesting it is now. Instead of you know now being the guy who only shoots you know the very famous people to go back into the hometowns of these new artists and tell their stories, uh, we had the luck of uh, doing one which I always re- remember. Sadly, uh, it, it, the, the story ended uh, tragically because this young guy, uh, his name of the artist was Juice World. He was becoming very big. Uh, he died. And he died at 19 years of age. Uh, but we spent a, a week almost in Chicago, going around South Chicago in his neighborhood, meeting his mother, meeting his family. Uh, and, you know, wh- one of the people we did in the very beginning was this very unknown uh, um, uh, girl called Billie Eilish <laughs> that no one knew of, uh, you know. Um, another artist was uh, her, this new artist uh, who's uh, incredible, who we did in Brooklyn. So it was a way to look again at uh, you know a new generation instead of uh, only fixing on the super successful. And I think that's been a, a leading thing for my life now. I'm like I'm looking for both uh, levels of projects. That's beautiful. And in um, in the relation with these corporations and. This includes also companies like like PepsiCo, like our company. What would be your advice as a creator working with these companies? What this company should do to really leverage what a creative can do in the best possible way? Mm. Yes, because you know uh, the, the 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 format is standard. You know, it's uh, Francesco. We are uh, late. First of all, we have to, <laughs> We're always in a rush, right? <laughs> I don't know how it is possible that all these companies, you know, uh, have, have always no time. But but it is possible because the world is moving so fast, and we th- we 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 um, we learned, if anything, with this uh, you know pandemic, that maybe things don't need to uh, move that fast. And so, the first thing to me is let's slow this process down. Uh, and then let's have real meetings and, you know, in order to start the inception of the, the project where we talk about the bigger create, why this creative vision? I understand that, you know, uh, we need to do a video that has this, this and that for the Super Bowl, blah, 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 blah. But why? Why has this been chosen? Why, you know, the... And, and that kind of helps you getting more motivated as a creative, where you're not just like, okay, now I have to give them just the best idea possible for the best budget possible to make it in the shortest time possible. Because those are not really the only important things. Uh, a lot of stuff that we reference from, you know, back in time uh, had a different pace, you know? Yeah. And so my, my big thing is like, let's slow down and not, rush into something that ends up sometimes not being exactly what you want. I believe in projects where th- that start almost creatively together, you know? And so that becomes um, a way of, th- the way you do that is also by changing the way the system works. Because right now creatives have to pitch and there's five, 10, 12 people pitching on the same idea and it's this competition and it's stressful. And oftentimes it's a you know a, a big a big endeavor for for nothing because you don't deliver you you don't maybe land the job or whatever, and um, and and uh, you know for example uh, with artists with musicians right now all I do is I only approach the project if I can talk to the artist um, you know I only talk I do the project if we can really like make this come alive together. That to me is exciting. Uh, the rest is part of a process, and it's what we all have to have to do and had to do. But I'm trying to um, to change it a little bit, at least as much as I can control. Uh, talking about the pace of life, uh, we both live in New York City, and every time I talk with creative people from all around the world, everybody's like, "Oh my God, what a dream to live in New York City!" It's so inspiring. And you are a, a very inspired uh, creative artist, but you have a 
conflictual rela relation with New York City. You have a house in LA, but you're always also in Long Island uh, and many other things. You, you love nature. You love a different pace of life, you know, from New York. What, what's your relation with a city like New York? And and what do you find in in the nature and in the in the in the cities in the places outside of New York? Yeah, well, you know, I think we always want what we can have. So it's, <laughs> let's let's start there. Um, I haven't had New York in many different ways, living in different places, and um, I think I experienced as as good as of a New York that I could have had. And for a very long time, New York was essential to my process. Uh, I always say I owe to two people who I am, my mother and New York, uh, New York being one of the two people, <laughs> mm, because really New York exposed me, New York challenged me, New York killed me, uh, New York made me feel, you know, the best, uh, you know, and, and so it's this crazy drug. Um, uh, what happened when I moved to Los Angeles before I came back to New York? because I met my wife and, you know, she's based here. And so I came back. What happened when I lived in Los Angeles, um, I opened up a type of life that I never thought was really possible, which was a life where you were not um, constantly waiting uh, to go on holiday to experience certain things. It's It was this weird mix of, <clears throat> oh, wow, eight hours a day I'm working and eight hours a day I'm on holiday. Uh, you know, and um, space, uh, uh, time by yourself, uh, you know, a lot of time in cars, which some people hate. It was my really one of my favorite things about Los Angeles. I was able to think so much, listen to music, listen to podcasts. Uh, it was almost like a protect. It's almost like, you know, when people say I love flying because no one bothers me. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. kind of what was the that, that car, the dimension for me. Um, so when I came back from, to New York, if you add the fact that I wasn't anymore in a phase where New York was so essential, right? Because I had my own circle of friends, circle of clients, people knew me in the industry. And so it was a little bit easier, you know, to, to work regardless of where I was. So when I came back to New York, I had this shock, you know? where I was like, wow, I'm back in a place where everything is fast. Uh, the subway stinks. Uh, it's cold. It's too hot. Uh, people are not very kind. Uh, a coffee costs $10, you know? And, 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 and so I felt like I, I deserved better, right? Uh, so um, ultimately, um, the way you feel when you're in New York, although I always criticize New York, is a way that no other places makes you feel. Uh, there's, there's a, even now when things are so, especially downtown, you know, you know that uh, uh, it's very different, right? If you live in the Upper East Side, New York is a different city right now. But if you live downtown in the creative areas, low, you know, Lower East Side, West Side, Soho, New York is deserted. New York seems, you know, uh, much less. Uh, it's just that people are not going into the office. So you have less traffic, less, which honestly, it's also very nice. Um, it's, it's even in this time, New York is still expressing something. It's saying no. It's saying we will come back. It's saying, yes, buy your house in the Catskills, but in two years, you're going to want to be back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's saying all of these things. You, you really feel it. It's the most resilient place in the world. Um, and I think that the reason why I can't fully detach from it is because I feel that um, even in this very difficult time, uh, you know, actually more importantly in this difficult time, New York will come back stronger. And when it comes back, you will be part of it. I was part of 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, glorious years after the, the you know, the recession. Um, I was younger. I had more opportunities then, uh, and I think this will bring a lot of opportunity. So I don't, I don't want to leave New York, but I do have to take a lot of breaks from New York, and I have to um, live in also in different ways. Where do you find your inspiration? 
Uh, it's uh, really all over. Um, right now, I'm, um, since I'm very locked in at home, um, I really find it in uh, books. Uh, I never really was a big fan of essays. Um, I'm reading more nonfiction. Uh, uh, I'm watching a lot of documentaries. There's a strange shift that happened maybe with a lot of people, not only with me. Um, with, the, you know, strangely, um, despite the time we're living, I'm not looking for comfort in fiction. I'm looking for comfort in reality. Um, I am not looking to escape. I'm kind of looking to be more present. Uh, and obviously, there's two ways to go in these terrible times, right? You either uh, say, no, I want to be here now, or uh, I want to dream of a different world. Uh, they're equally interesting. Maybe in the beginning, when things were so shocking, I really escaped. Uh, but now I feel, I feel very present. I feel uh, like I want to know what people think. I want to know what the people's concerns are. I, I, there's a lot of stuff that is happening right now historically in America that I think is very, very fascinating. Yeah. Well, uh, talking about what's going on right now, in, in your mm, movie on your mother, on Franca Cows and Creation, you uh, talk about the black issue. If, I, if I'm not wrong, you were talking in the documentary about uh, that historic uh, issue of Vogue, uh, all dedicated to uh, black models and, and literally talking about the topic it was very difficult, especially back then, especially in the fashion world. Uh, you're very well aware, obviously, of everything is going on right now in America, Black Lives Matter. Uh, what's your point of view on all of this in over the years? In, everything is, is happening right now uh, in, in, you in know, the world of race. We... We Italians, um, I think, partially understand this problem. Um, America is much more complex. Um, America has a different history. Um, not, not that uh, Italy doesn't have a dramatic history on, on, on many levels, as we were uh, the one ally of Hitler. But, uh, you know, uh, America came and changed a lot of things for us since uh, we have been uh, very supportive of America and and we don't have the same history of immigration. We don't have the same history of... Uh, because Italy is already a country of immigrants within itself, right? There's a lot of immigration between South and North, and the unification of Italy is 100 years younger than America, right? So very difficult, very difficult to compare. Um, what I think is, uh, I think it's time for a change. It's time for a big change. And um, out of uh, bad things, hopefully come progress. Um, America four years ago, four years ago, uh, was a completely different place. Uh, Me Too didn't happen. Uh, Black Lives Matter was, you know, obviously not, not happening, but it was very different from what's been happening right now. We have to go extremely on the other side to meet back uh, in the middle. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, the conversation needs to get pushed. It needs to be in our faces. Uh, you know, uh, it needs to become really about, um, um, uh, you know, let's open up, let's change, let's really change, not just like say we are changing. Um, and this will create some tension, right? Because obviously, uh, every time you go too extremely on one side, there are going to be frictions. Um, but I think frictions are necessary. Uh, talking about philosophy, you know, Giambattista Vico, the Italian philosopher and historian, says there are cycles and recycles in history. You go forward, two steps, you go back one step. You go forward, two steps, you go back one step. So it will create tension, but I think it's necessary. What are you working on right now? You, you mentioned a, a movie that mm -hmm. you're, you're about to start. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. This uh, is a, another project of uh, sweat, blood, and tears. Um, I started uh, uh, four years ago. I read the book uh, right after uh, we released um, uh, the documentary. Uh, 
and I remember my mother was still alive and I told her, you know, I found this book. I think we're going to make it into a movie. Uh, four years later, between uh, coronavirus, uh, uh, you know, financing uh, troubles and whatever, uh, we haven't shot it, but we are doing it this summer. Thankfully, the movie was, uh, the picture, as they say, it was greenlit. So uh, it's happening. Um, it's a novel by the famous uh, Norwegian writer, John Asbo. Um, it's not um, his most famous novel. It's a, it's a smaller novel he wrote called Midnight Sun. Um, the title of the film, uh, for various reasons, and uh, will end up being um, The Hanging Sun, uh, and uh, based on Midnight Sign, the novel by John Asbo. And it's a novel about um, a man who wants to erase his past uh, and uh, kind of uh, not, not truly erase his past, but accept his past uh, and move on. Um, it's a story about uh, fatherhood. It's a, a story about what it means to be um, a, a son, not only a father. Uh, and I think it was uh, very important for me uh, in the you know in the time I, I read it because uh, all of a sudden I was about to become uh, the only adult in the family, you know, the the, the only one responsible, uh, uh, potentially one day. Uh, not anymore a son, but potentially one day a father. And um, and I also was a guy who was uh, coming to terms with uh, some past and some uh, some issues. So something I uh, identify very much with. Um, I found a great actor, uh, very well known in Italy, named Alessandro Borghi, who's going to play the lead. Uh, and he's going to be surrounded by international uh, cast. It's a movie in English, so he's going to act in English. Um, he's the son of immigrants in the in the book, so in the film. So there's obviously some uh, you know story points that justify accents and all of that <laughs> stuff. But he's a sublime actor, and it's a beautiful story that shoots in the north of the world. So in the summer, so when the sun never goes down. Uh, that's the title. Uh, that's the reason of the title. Um, it's a thriller, um, but at the same time, it's a love story. And uh, there's this very tender relationship with this uh, kid that he meets along the way and with his mother, um, which uh, I hope uh, the audience will enjoy. <laughs> so you're shooting in the summer and you know already when it will be released, if everything goes well? Probably, probably the uh, 19, um, 2022. Well, Francesco, we, we touched so many different topics, philosophy and photography and genetics, and, and we talk about resilience and we talk about passion and vision and asking why and doubts. I think he is so inspiring in so many levels for so many different kinds of people in so many different situations. So thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your insights. Thank you for having me. And uh, it was equally inspiring to talk to you and to share my experience. Thank you, Fra. Ciao. Ciao.